Okay, hello and welcome to Thinkific's Teach Online TV, the place to be if you want to learn how to create and sell online courses successfully. My name is Tyler Basu, I'm the content manager for Thinkific, and today I have the pleasure of welcoming a very special guest to the show. He is an internationally recognized expert on SEO, a best-selling author, and the co-author of The Art of SEO, which is literally uh, almost a 1,000 page book. It's considered the Bible on search engine optimization it's received fan, uh, many incredible testimonials from people like Seth Godin and Tony Shea, and it's even used as a textbook at universities. Uh, he also speaks around the world at internet marketing conferences. He contributes to online publications, and he has two of his own podcasts. So, Stefan, uh, welcome to the show. I know I covered a lot of, uh, of highlights there, but I really appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to chat with us today. Oh, of course. I'm glad to be here. I want to teach you guys uh, all the magic uh, involved in SEO. This, uh, this, is a, this is a really important topic. Um, we get asked about it all the time, and so I'm, I'm really excited to, uh, to have you share your insights with us. Uh, now, before we jump into it, could you just take a moment to tell us uh, how you got into this space, first of all? I mean, what were you doing before, and, and how did you become the SEO expert that you're known as today? Yeah, so I was studying for a PhD in biochemistry, and I decided that the internet would be a great place to be. I was um, attending, well, actually, I presented a uh, paper at the second International World Wide Web Conference in 1994. This was when everybody was using NCSA Mosaic as their web browser, uh, before everyone had heard of Netscape. And I met one of the guys from Netscape at that conference. I met Rob McCool. Do you know who that is? I don't know. I don't, I'm trying to think what I was doing in 1994, probably watching cartoons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, Rob McCool is kind of a big deal. Okay. Uh, he, he created the NCSA server, HTTP uh, server, and then he created Netscape server, and then Apache. So he's the creator of Apache. I met him at this conference in 1994. I'm like, wow, I need to be on the internet bandwagon. So within a few months, I had dropped out of my PhD program and started an agency. And I had no business skills or, or experience. I'd never even taken any business classes or marketing classes. I was just winging it. And uh, it was a lot of fun because I, uh, you know, it's all blue sky back in those days. Yeah. So many people, uh, didn't know what they were doing with the, with the whole internet marketing thing. So yeah, I started uh, doing SEO in uh, the 90s, a couple years after I started doing the web development stuff and web marketing, I started focusing on, uh, on search. And around that time, I also decided to move to New Zealand because, you know, it's like a beautiful part of the world. I'd never been there before and I decided to apply for residency and got in and moved halfway around the world. So you can do this internet thing from anywhere, basically, mm -hmm. is the bottom line. Yeah, very cool. So it's definitely been quite a journey. Um, you've been in the online yeah. space pretty much since, you know, the the, the early days of the internet. Uh, what are you focused on today? Uh, could you just tell us a little bit about your business today? Um, you know, what takes up most of your time? And then we'll jump into uh, we'll jump into this topic here. Yeah, so I'm working primarily uh, consulting with clients. I do a lot of speaking at conferences, but uh, the way that I uh, generate most of my revenue is through consulting. I've worked with such big brands as uh, Chanel and Zappos and Bed Bath & Beyond, um, Sony, Quicksilver, um, also smaller companies and uh, startups even. I had an agency that I started in in. 1995, as I mentioned, uh, when I dropped out of my PhD, and I ran that for 15 years, so I was able to uh, have a successful exit. I ma made uh, uh, some money on, on that nice. and then made more money when that company got acquired. So the, my acquiring company got acquired themselves by IPROS, well, actually by Dentsu Aegis, the multi-billion dollar ad agency conglomerate that owns iProspect, um, bought Kavari, which had bought Net Concepts. That was my agency. Interesting. So, okay. You don't hear that fun. happening too often. That's great. Yeah. So um, I, I'm just really passionate about SEO. I I couldn't imagine retiring from this space. It's it's a lot of fun, and it's getting more interesting yeah. as the technology advances at a faster and faster clip. So you have things like uh, artificial intelligence really making a huge difference in how SEO uh, is, is done these days compared with, 
even just a few years ago. Right, right. Um, and you're also a you're also a course creator, correct? You've got a membership site with students that you share your uh, with your expertise with. I do. Yes, I'm uh, uh, doing a course a month. And I also have a larger, longer course that was my first course I, I created back in uh, about October, September, October last year. That one's on do-it-yourself SEO auditing. Mm-hmm. Quite an in-depth course on everything from uh, analyzing your, your link authority and um, the quality and diversity of your inbound links to looking at uh, the technical side of SEO, crawling through your site with a spider like Screaming Frog and um, the content side of things and keyword selection, all that in in that one particular course. And then I started doing these uh, monthly courses and a membership site just uh, like four months ago. So I've got four courses, five courses now under my belt. It's a lot of fun. Uh, And I, I love the ability to scale my knowledge and experience to people who wouldn't normally be able to afford working with me. Right. So I, I want to make a difference for a lot of people, not just a few. And that's part of the reason why I have my two podcasts. One of them is marketing, uh, specific, uh, podcast called marketing speak. And, uh, the other one is more kind of biohacking, life hacking, self-help productivity, that sort of stuff. That one's the optimized geek. Right. So even though that sounds like an SEO podcast, it's not. Yeah, yeah. I was just gonna say the optimized one that makes me think of SEO when I when I hear that word. But I know, I know. So optimizedgeek.com the, yeah. for you guys who want to check that out, and then marketingspeak.com for the marketing one, and and both are excellent. I I'm biased, of course, but they are. I'll, 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 I'll vouch for you. I've uh, I've listened to both shows, and I agree they they are excellent podcasts. And I listen I listen to a lot of podcasts, but the the quality is definitely there. Some great tips and some great guests that you that you've had on the shows as well Um, yeah i mean i can't believe i was able to land for example dan kennedy yeah (laughs) that's a big deal i mean he's he's hard to reach you you can't even call him you have to fax his assistant (laughs) who then faxes him yeah it's pretty funny that uh, that is pretty funny uh, so one of the reasons why I wanted to dive into this topic with you um, is we get asked all the time from our community, uh, you know, what are some of the ways that people can spread the word about their online course, get more exposure for their courses, attract more right. students who are searching for the topic that they teach on the internet. They want to be found in those search results. Um, and as you know, there's a lot of ways to market a course. You've been in the online space for a long time, so you've probably touched everything from you know webinars to affiliate marketing to paid advertising, social media yep. marketing, content marketing. Like it's quite a rabbit hole. All of the different methods of, of that you can market something online. But in your opinion, uh, why is SEO worth our time and attention? Why is it so important for us to dive into this topic? Uh, you know, when comparing it to some of those other ways that we can market something on the internet. Yeah. So a lot of folks will uh, focus on the paid traffic side of things, paid media. And the problem with that is the moment you stop spending money is the moment you stop receiving the traffic and the leads. Mm -hmm. Big problem, right? Because that's not really building an asset. That's just relying on a partner to do the work for you. If you have an asset, like let's say you, I'll use Robert Kiyosaki's analogy of an asset versus a liability from Rich Dad Poor Dad. A house that you live in is a liability because you keep spending money, the toilet breaks and you know stuff happens and you're, you're spending money every month. It's taking money out of your pocket. Therefore, it's a liability, not an asset. Whereas a house that you own that you then rent out that is an asset. It makes money for you every month, puts money in your pocket, and you should I, you, you should um, build up assets in your online business, mm-hmm. including SEO, because if you build up your link profile, for example, you get better, higher quality links with more authority, more trust, more importance. That is an asset that stays with you month after month, pays Uh, you month after month year after year in terms of more traffic more leads it's not like somebody's going to link to you from their blog and then two months later say ah you know what I'm gonna remove that link now right they put it in there they have blogged about you and it's in the archives forever right yeah so that is going to pay dividends to you for as long as that link is there which probably be indefinite 
So build up your assets, and SEO is one of the best um, uh, assets that you can have. And, and uh, you know, it's free traffic, but you still have to spend money on creating great content that's link worthy and seeding it into places where the linkerati hang out. You know, these are the people and, and the website owners, the yeah. bloggers who have a lot of authority and trust in the eyes of Google. And when they link to you, that makes a big difference. Yeah. Not uh, just Jim Bob's personal homepage linking to you. That doesn't matter so much. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there are other things that you can do to uh, I- improve your online assets as well that are not SEO. But mm-hmm. it's just I think this is a no brainer. Mm-hmm. Everybody needs to do SEO, even the tiny guy and the huge conglomerate they all need to do it yeah absolutely and, and you you mentioned some of the biggest benefits you know uh, and i love the analogy that you used of you know an asset versus a liability and with paid advertising as you said if you stop spending money then you stop getting exposure and potentially sales for your course um, yeah. whereas if you're building an asset let's say a blog for example your website for example even your your course uh, you know the sales page for your course if these things are you know ranking in search engines and people who are interested in your course topic you know as they're searching for answers to their questions as they're searching for a course to take perhaps if they find you that's very powerful because that didn't cost you anything other than the time and energy you put up front uh, to create your course and create your blog and perhaps publish right. articles and things like that. But they're finding you on their own. It's not costing you anything. And that can happen day after day after day, um, mm-hmm. especially if you're ranking well in search engines. Now, that's yeah. something that I wanted to talk about as well is how we get our our content, our websites ranking on search engines because... Right. I mean, there's a, you know, there's a, the secret algorithm uh, where there's a lot of factors involved um, that most of us are unaware of. But what are what are the main things that move the needle? Let's say if we've got a course on uh, how to train your dog, let's say, um, what are some of the main things that we could do to make sure that our stuff is found when somebody's going over to Google or Yahoo or whatever search engine they're using and they're and they're typing in how do I train my dog or you know how do I learn how to train a dog or, or anything related to that topic so what are some of those main factors that really move the needle right so let's break this into two major areas okay on one hand you have on page factors and on the other hand you have off page factors okay the on page factors would be things that are on the page that you're trying to optimize on the course page, on your main page that has all your courses listed on it. That's on page factors. Title tag, for example, that's the most important on page element. It's given the most weight out of all the things on the page. Mm -hmm. You also have stuff that's behind the scenes that's not really visible to the user until they view source, like the meta description, which incidentally doesn't affect your rankings it's only going to influence this snippet that's displayed in your search listing. Uh, so it can improve the click-through rate, but it's not gonna improve your ranking. It's, it's a second order activity, therefore. It's not one of the first things that I would focus on optimizing. But it's a very easy thing to optimize. Put your keywords in there that you're trying to uh, focus on. What will happen is if that search listing, uh, your search listing uses the meta description, Google will do something called keywords in context or quick, uh, KWIC, keywords in context, Mm -hmm. and it'll bold the words that were searched on in close uh, synonyms. So user types in how to train your dog, and the meta description says, this is the best course on dog training you'll ever find. Well, dog training will be bolded because it's very similar, very close synonym to how to train your dog as the search query right. and the bolded words in the search listing will draw the eye and cause people to click more. Um, but like I said, it's not going to move your rankings up to have a really great meta description. So that's not the first thing I'd focus on. Start with the title tag. As far as the on-page factors, it's the most important. And then things like the body copy and the placement of the important words, the keywords you're trying to rank for. Mm-hmm. That those need to be high up in the uh, in the page, mm-hmm. not just in the HTML, but in the rendered page, so that they're visible to users. Because Googlebot will render your page, 
it will uh, the, the the algorithm will figure out whether it's supposed to be displayed at the top of the second column before you scroll or it's below the fold after you scroll and, and it's not quite as visible even though it's high up in the HTML. Google can figure all that out now and has been able to for years. So if you're trying to play tricks and put stuff high up in the HTML that you want Google to think is important and then you put it down in the footer on the rendered page because you don't want your users to see it, Google figures that out and is like, ah, yeah, you're playing tricks with us. We don't like that. Right, right. Yeah. So there are the on-page factors, like I described, yep. body copy, words you use in the body copy, title tag, et cetera. And then the off-page factors will include things like the links that point to your site, the anchor text that is used in those links. If they're using click here in the anchor text, that's telling Google, hey, this page is all about click here. That's not as ideal as if they use dog training course. Here is a great, and then they underline, make it a link, mm -hmm. dog training course, and they link to your course page. That's fantastic because Google takes those underlined words, well, they don't have to be underlined, but the anchor text, yep. and associates it with the page that's being linked to, in this case, your course, yep. right? So on-page factors, you can more easily uh, adjust and optimize because you have control over your, your site and your Thinkific um, uh, account. Off-page factors is almost like PR, public relations, where you're asking people, influencers, the linkerati, ideally, those folks who really matter in the eyes of Google, to link to you and link to you in a certain way and from certain pages that are more important than others. Mm -hmm and you have no control, you just hopefully have a bit of influence. Uh, you don't wanna buy links or uh, do sketchy sort of link building, buy 100 links or 1,000 links for $99, that sort of stuff, because those links will be really garbage yeah. and you can get a penalty for that. And we could get into the details of Penguin and the changes that happened uh, with Penguin 4.0 and so forth, but I don't wanna get too much in the weeds uh, with our listeners. So just the idea here is that you want to get high quality links that are trusted sites linking to you. Uh, so if you could get a link from Harvard University, for example, or Stanford, that's way better than Jim's uh, personal homepage right. linking to you. And one way that you can check to see how trusted and authoritative these sites are that you're hoping to get links from is to use a tool like Majestic, Majestic.com or ahrefs.com or uh, linkresearchtools.com or Open Site Explorer from Moz, uh, Moz.com. Mm -hmm. So these are all link analysis tools where you can plug in uh, a website URL or, or domain name and see if that site has a lot of trust and authority. In Open Site Explorer from Moz, you'd look at what's called what they call Moz Trust. It's their approximation of of trust rank. Okay. Okay. And then also Moz rank would be another thing to look at, which is their approximation of page rank, which doesn't incorporate trust, but is really more about importance. So that's useful. Gives you an idea whether it's a highly trusted website you're trying to get a link from or not. But um, my one of my favorite tools I go to all the time. Is, well, I, I got a bunch of favorite tools, but uh, it's really easy for your uh, viewers and, and listeners just to go to majestic.com, M-A-J-E-S-T-I-C.com, and even without a paid account, you can check uh, several sites a day and see what the uh, what, what they call trust flow mm -hmm. and citation flow scores are. And these are on a logarithmic scale. So if you see a website has a 50 out of 100 in trust flow, that's a pretty good score, but it's not halfway to 100 because of the logarithmic nature of trust flow and, for that matter, Moz rank and Moz trust. And uh, many of these metrics are logarithmic because page rank is logarithmic in nature, like a Richter scale. Right. I was just going to ask, is that like a Richter scale? Yeah. So a 5 out of 10 on the Richter scale is no big deal in comparison to a 6, right. which is much worse. But a 7 on the Richter scale can be catastrophic in comparison to a six. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. No, this is great. You've shared some some great tips already. Um, and both with the on page and the uh, with the on page and the off page factors. Uh, and we and we're not trying to like we're not trying to trick the search engines here, which is why I brought you on to to learn some of the fundamentals yeah. um, that we can rely on long term. And you know, if Google has an update or, or something along those lines, uh, you know, we we're not we're not totally screwed. Um, exactly. It's <laughs> so important. I, I, you you've got to play the long game here. Yes. It, yes. If you think about Google how advanced they are with all their PhDs working for them. There's no point and, trying to outsmart them or trick them. Exactly. It's like they are keeping a rap sheet on all of us and have been for a long time. So you do stuff that you think you got away with, and then Google figures out maybe after the fact that you were doing that, you never got a penalty, but it put it on its record like, hey, this this guy or gal likes to cut corners and uh, play games with us, so we're going to keep note of that. And then you do this enough, and all that history is going to eventually come back to bite you. Right. Bad, bad idea. Just play by the rules. Uh, be legit. White hat, in other words. And, uh, and, and it'll be sustainable. What you're creating will be sustainable. So hopefully you're creating a business that is saleable because if you don't have a business that could be sold at some point, you just have a job. You're self-employed and that's very different from having a business. A business is an asset. A business can survive if you aren't there and a business needs to be sustainable. If you're creating stuff that's short term, like, oh, I got away with this thing. I did this PBN thing and it worked for a while. I'm going to yeah. lay off of it for PBN stands for private blog network. Don't ever do that kind of garbage. I've never done that. It's just ridiculous. You're asking to get uh, smacked by Google either now or in the future. So play by the rules. Mm. Great, great advice, great and great warning for 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 everyone out there. Um, now, I uh, I want to br- talk about keywords a little bit um, because it's mm-hmm. it, it's a huge piece of SEO. Um, when you've touched on this already, but there's a few things that we're trying to do. We're trying to uh, have our website or our course show up in the search results for certain keywords or search terms that people are using when they're when they're looking right. for information on a particular topic. And the other thing that we want to do is have other sites that are high quality sites, high authority sites or related to our industry or our topic linking back to us and and not the, you know, click here type links but relevant keywords um, that help describe what we're known for and what our course or our website is about. So you, you right. touched on that as well. Um, but I am curious how would a course creator who has you know a particular topic that they teach what can they do to find out which are the most uh, common or popular search terms that their target audience is using to find their course in the first place Um, yeah and because they're not always going to be searching for the exact title of that person's course and even if they are they you know their course still might not be the first result that they see so what how can we know what are what the what the people that we're trying to reach um, are searching for in the first place? That's a great, great question, right? Uh, especially when we're talking about courses, because we don't know uh, what terminology people are using in terms of is it a training that they're looking for, or a course, an, uh, an online course, or a seminar, or um, a certification. And although Google understands the relatedness of these keywords, synonyms, and so forth. Google calls them entities. Google understands these relationships. A certification is a very different thing, even though it's related to an online course. If you provide certification, then you know somebody wants to uh, have that that uh, badge to display that they've been certified. That will help them get more clients or retain clients for longer, whatever. That's a different sort of deal. So you need to understand what are our, uh, what's my target market looking for? Are they looking for certification or are they just looking for training? Mm-hmm. Are they looking for a course or are they looking for more of a, a longer term curriculum? So using tools, and some of them are free, some of them are paid, will give you insight into which keywords are more popular than others. So let me run through first some uh, free ones and then we'll go into some paid ones. So, um, and I'll also break this down by brainstorming type of activities versus doing the kind of data collection where you're getting hard numbers from these tools. So we'll start with 
the free ones, and we'll focus on the brainstorming ones first. Okay, so um, I don't know if you'd like me to share my screen and if walk you, you through some of these. Yeah, if uh, you yeah if you can, and if it helps explain, then absolutely. It's it's way more powerful to do that. So let me do that. Okay, so let's start with Google Trends, which is at trends.google.com, or you can get there by going to google.com slash trends, either way. And let's say I want to compare two different keywords uh, to each other. Let's try uh, Nikon cameras and Canon cameras. And Canon. So I'm separating these with commas. And I can look at geographic distribution. I can look at the trend over time. I can look at uh, related rising uh, queries, terms that are trending. And so it defaults to top, but I can look at rising as well. So I can switch to rising. So it's showing for both keywords that I put in. I can have multiple keywords, not just two. I could just do one if I wanted. But see how I can see that, for example, with Nikon cameras, more popular in the US as far as search volume uh, compared to Canada. In South America, Brazil is uh, popular, not really like Argentina, for example. And I can see if uh, things stack up, how things stack up in terms of Canon versus Nikon. And uh, here I'm seeing the trend graph. It's telling me that Nikon is less popular than Canon and has been uh, since 2002, uh, 12, 2012. So interesting, right? You wouldn't have guessed this unless you use this tool. And here's another kind of uh, almost Easter egg. It's, it's so little known among SEOs. If you wanted to check this in YouTube and not just Google, click instead of web search, click on YouTube search. And look at that, you can see how popular these keywords are, in this case, Nikon versus Canon cameras, uh, in YouTube searches, because guess what the number two search engine is? YouTube. YouTube, it's not Bing and it's not Yahoo. Isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. So that's a free tool, and we can use that for brainstorming by looking at uh, related queries uh, that are top queries and rising uh, queries. Um, you know what the easiest tool is that we've all used to um, that can be for keyword brainstorming is just the Google search box. Okay. So you start typing in a keyword like let's do, let's do dog training. So dog training, and we can see some of these popular keywords: dog training classes, dog training collars, dog uh, training near me, dog training videos, etc. Notice that I'm in the LA area. So this is a uh, geographically relevant query. So these suggestions will be uh, based in part on your geographic location and your search history. Okay. So bear that in mind that these are um, you know, customized, personalized suggestions to you, but they are mostly based on popularity. Okay. Pretty cool, mm -hmm. right? And it's a free tool just built right into the Google search box. And then another awesome brainstorming tool that takes it to a whole other level, this uh, Google uh, search um, suggestion tool called Google Suggest. Watch this. I'm going to start typing dog training into this tool. Isn't that amazing? I'm typing in my phrase wow. dog training, and it's auto-completing or giving these auto-complete suggestions yeah. just so just like Google did a minute ago, but not just from Google, but also Bing, Yahoo, YouTube, Answers.com, Wikipedia, Amazon, all simultaneously. It's so cool. And so, the so I can see that that dog training is really popular, and dog training uh, like uh, tips and tricks are uh, those are very popular sorts of keywords, not just on Google, but also YouTube, Bing. Um, not so much Yahoo, um, but Bing and YouTube and Google really show this as popular. Um, yeah, no, so that, that's very that's very cool. powerful. Like I, I can picture somebody you know typing their topic into this, 
and now they've got you know a dozen or more ideas for blog post headlines and keywords to put yeah. on their course sales page different lessons for inside of the course perhaps um, i mean there's a lot of uh, a lot of insight that you can pull from this right you could even use this as ideas for um kind of teaser courses that would be a lead in in your in your marketing funnel to get people to your paid courses you offer a free uh, course, uh, Thinkific course, or whatever platform you're using, um, and use that as a feeder into your paid course. Maybe the main paid course is a thousand dollars, nine ninety seven, but your free one. Let's say you take an aspect of dog training. Let's say so look look at how popular dog training collars are. Mm. I didn't even know you could the a dog training collar is a thing. I just thought, okay, you, your dog wears a collar, right? But no, there's a collar specific for dog training. I don't know. What it does, I'm guessing shocking them because they see the next most popular eBay suggestion is dog training shock collar. Right. That sounds kind of evil, but whatever. Right. Uh, we'll just run with this for a minute, this example. Let's say you offer a mini training on dog training collars and using them to train your dog. Yeah. And so you give that information away for free. It's a small course, and they, they, they get some success with it, and they're like, wow, I want to do more. I want to be able to take my dog to dog shows and I want uh, my dog to do like circus tricks and all sorts of stuff. What's the next step? And of course you have your paid course that you feed them into and, like, and, and you upsell them to from the, from the free course. And you might not have even gotten this idea to do this particular type of free course until you used a brainstorming tool like uh, Suval to see that opportunity. Well, that, that's, uh, that's excellent. Um, were there were there a couple other tools you wanted to cover as well? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So let's do another uh, free tool called Answer the Public. We're still in the brainstorming phase. I love this tool. It's really fun, and it tells me based on Google Suggest again, right? So we type in things into Google search box, and we get ten suggestions back. Um, so it's based on on that same you know uh, data. So watch this. I'm going to put in dog training into answer the public. I've switched the country to U.S. This is finding for me question-based search queries to target because um, a lot of people are asking questions like, "How do I do this?" or uh, "Where do I find this?" or and and a, a course would be a great answer to that query. I mean, you want to answer succinctly. A, a kind of a mini answer to the question, but then drive them into uh, the course, uh, or at least a, a, a video of um, answering that question and, and leading into the course, right? So you can give them teasers, and um, if you've got a video-based course, you train them on one topic. It's kind of like giving them results in advance. Uh, this is from uh, Frank Kern, who s says that uh, results in advance works really well. You teach somebody how to play the guitar in your online course, but first you teach them for free the F chord because the F chord is challenging for a newbie. And if you help them nail it with the free training, they really appreciate yeah. that and they're much more uh, inclined to take your paid course and the whole thing. If you give away your best stuff for free, people will still pay you money and take the rest of your course. So you can find all these great opportunities, the things that people are searching for um, in, in the areas uh, that are related to your topic uh, using uh, tools like Answer the Public. So um, I don't know why this is not showing any uh, anything here for uh, questions, but here are some preposition-based uh, dog training search uh, suggestions because again all the data comes from uh, Google suggest and this is just an interface so here are um, uh, let's see those are oh well, I want to get some prepositions here so dog training to become a service dog yeah. so that's kind of like a question interesting yeah. right so if I wanted to provide some useful information you might I, you might ask well why am i suggesting you create a succinct text answer because you want to get what's called a featured snippet so we'll, look at this if i type in how to boil an egg as my search query i'm going to get an an answer to the question right here 
that first um, listing is actually called a featured snippet. Mm. And you'll notice it is a numbered list. Mm -hmm. That's the best answer to how to boil an egg is, an, is a numbered list rather than a paragraph. There are different types of featured snippets, paragraph snippets, ordered list, uh, numbered list snippets, uh, bulleted uh, list snippets where it's not numbered, and table snippets. So if, if you see that um, your competitor is ranking for um, a, a search at, with a featured snippet and it's a paragraph and you know that it would be a better answer if it were a numbered list, create a better answer that's a numbered list. Use the OL and LI tags in your HTML and make it a numbered list. And you might be able to overtake your competitor's featured snippet, steal that featured snippet from them because they had a weak one that was a paragraph and it would be better answered as a numbered list. Okay. Yeah. So identifying the right keywords that feature featured snippets is a great strategy so that you can get essentially position zero in the search results because this preempts the first organic result. Now, in this case, the featured snippet is the first organic result as well. Mm -hmm. So here's the uh, that's where they actually got position it one. But that doesn't happen all the time. In fact, most of the time, it's from another listing besides number one. So you might be number three or six on the page. Yeah. And you could still take that featured snippet, so that's pretty cool if uh, if you get that opportunity. So um, use answer the public to identify some question based um, uh, search queries. If um, here I'm going to put in another one, I'll put in SEO as an example to see what um, questions we can get that are SEO based. Um, I just I, I love this tool. It, I love the visual way it displays. Uh, like, look oh, at the, wow. how pretty that and looks. Different types of questions: how, why, which, where, who. That's how the questions start. Yep. yep. Oh, and then you can change to uh, data view, which just shows tabular data instead. So you can see all the whiches and the whos and the whys and the whens and so forth. Um, you can go back to visualization mode and see it all pretty, and take a screenshot yeah. and show that to your boss and impress <laughs> him or her. Also show them Suvel and say, oh, look what I'm doing with my SEO project. And they're like, wow, as you start typing, like start type dog training, and then it auto suggests from Google, Bing, Yahoo, YouTube, Answers.com, all simultaneously as you're typing. And they're like, whoa, that's so cool. And it's a free tool. Yeah. Okay, so that's all the free stuff that um, is for brainstorming. Let's uh, I'll give you a sampler of a, a few paid tools for keyword research. Um, I'll also mention, which is kind of a, a hybrid between a paid tool and a free tool because um, of the way that they've uh, made it work these days, is Google AdWords Keyword Planner. Okay. So the Keyword Planner, you can easily find it just by typing into Google, Google Keyword Planner. Um, but if you are not spending money on Google AdWords, you're not advertising with Google, then this tool is hobbled. It doesn't work very well. It only gives ranges. Like, it might give a hundred thousand to a million as a range that's, for a that's keyword, a huge range. and that's that's ridiculous. It's it's almost useless. I want to know that it was two hundred and ten thousand, not that it was between a, a hundred thousand and a million. So you need to spend money on AdWords in order to use the keyword planner. Um, otherwise, it's just basically useless. So. Um, let me show you a couple quick things with uh, with this tool, and uh, then we'll move on to a couple other uh, tools that are some of my favorites. So, um, yeah, let's start with um, how do we get data in here? You just put in your keywords one per line or with commas. So let's do um, dog training, and we'll compare that with dog um, training uh, collar and dog training collars. And let's see how that shows up. And, and, uh, you can also limit it to just us or you can make it global or you could make it, um, Canada or whatever. It will give you other keywords that it suggests and see how useless this is just showing these ranges. So a, a workaround is if you have clients, and they're spending money on AdWords, have them add 
you as a manager to their account, and then you can switch uh, to that mm -hmm. account, and and this becomes a useful tool. So um, I could do that, but uh, in the interest of yeah. time, I'm, I'm gonna just uh, jump to another tool. And oh, one other thing too, is that there's a column uh, that you'll see, um, you can change the columns that are displayed uh, but one of the columns that's really useful is the column of uh, the um, the monthly trend, okay. and you can see that the last 12 months that there's a lot of seasonality in some keywords, and some keywords there's no seasonality at all. It's just flat through the year. Like uh, cameras go way up in volumes, search volume in the holiday season because people are buying them for Christmas right. presents. Um, okay, so let's use another tool. This one's from Moz, and it is called the um, Keyword Explorer. So that's at moz.com slash explorer. And many of these tools will allow you to do a free search or a free use, or a few of them, per day, even though they're paid tools. So this is a paid tool, um, but you can get a, a, a few searches in here per day uh, for free. It's really, it's awesome. Cause he, let me show you why I'm going to put in dog training again. And what you're going to see here is it's not just showing me search volume numbers, which is important, but also difficulty, opportunity, and priority. Mm. It's like, what, how is that? How <laughs> that's amazing. Right? So it, also notice under the volume, it's giving me a range, and I just railed on Google for providing ranges like a, a hundred thousand to a million. But this I'm much more okay with because the range is only because they want to provide 95% accuracy, so within one standard deviation accuracy, and so that's why it's a range. They are 95% certain that dog training as a keyword is within this monthly search volume of 30,000 to 70,000 a month. Okay. So that's why they're giving ranges. Um, the difficulty takes into account how hard it is to break into the top 10 for that particular keyword on an organic basis. Yeah, you could look at the Google AdWords Keyword Planner and see the AdWords competitiveness and use that kind of as a proxy and say, well, if it's competitive and AdWords is probably competitive and organically too, but this is an organic competitiveness metric. So that's really cool. Next up is opportunity, which it takes into account how much screen real estate is taken up by different words on the page. And uh, let's say that uh, I mean different words on the uh, different uh, other types of um, things like ads and SERP features on the page. So you're competing with not only the other organic listings, but you're competing with the, uh, the, the ads at the top, the ads at the bottom, the uh, knowledge yeah. panel on the side, if there is one, and uh, other SERP features like instant answers, which are different from featured snippets, it's basically an answer without a link to another website. Like how tall is the Eiffel Tower? You Google that and it gives you an instant answer, but it doesn't need to provide a link to somebody's website for further detail about it. It's That's the answer. So all those different SERP features take up screen real estate and take it away from the organic listing. So the opportunity for dog training is 83%, which is pretty good, uh, but dog collars would be a lot worse because there are um, Google shopping results mm. and, uh, oh, actually it's not so bad, it's 84%. So when you have other stuff taking up screen real estate, then the opportunity percentage goes right. down. And then the last uh, one here, priority is you prioritize, um, there's a place where you can add, you can build keyword lists. I don't have time to show you this, but you build keyword lists and then you can prioritize these uh, keywords and, give them an importance level to your business. And then all that is taken into account to determine um, where you should focus your energies. So it takes into account the volume, the difficulty, the opportunity, and your ranking for that particular keyword. And then you can focus your efforts where they matter the most based on all those metrics. So that's Keyword Explorer. I love that tool. Um, the last tool I'll leave you guys with 
um, but there's so many. I, I, I'm passionate about SEO, as you can tell, and, and I, I love keyword research as, uh, in particular. Yeah. But um, the topic explorer from Search Metrics. So Search Metrics has this um, um, content suite that they recently. Oh, and you got to use Chrome for this, um, not Safari. So. The content suite includes something called the Topic Explorer. So let me show you what that does. And remember earlier on I spoke about entities being uh, how Google sees keywords because keywords aren't just like the exact match keyword you're trying to type in. It's like the related synonyms and um, – uh, different verb tenses and uh, singulars and plurals, all those are mapped into uh, relationships. So Google is very smart in understanding all those relationships. Well, what if you didn't have a keyword research tool, but instead a topic research tool? Wouldn't that be awesome? And that's exactly what this tool provides. So check this out. So I'm going to go into the content uh, tool and I'm going to create a brief and here I'm going to put in a keyword like uh, I don't know let's do dog training again why not and um, what this is going to allow me to do here is I'll see the relationships between that topic and other related topics and it's going to do this visually it's going to allow me to differentiate based on things like seasonality of those topics. They'll be color-coded based on seasonality. They'll be color-coded uh, alternatively based on uh, popularity, based on competitiveness, based on search intent, like where in the funnel are they, awareness um, or, or retention or um, purchase, et cetera. So here is uh, search intent. Um, oh, and... Uh, actually, sales funnel is where you get the awareness and retention and purchase consideration, all that. So you get color coding based on that, color coding based on search intent, informational searches, navigational, transactional. Those are all different types of searches. If you're searching transactional keywords, then you probably have your wallet out. You're ready to buy. So that's really good. For course creators, most of your search queries that you're targeting are probably going to be informational. Right. You can teach people how to train their dog, how to, um, uh, you know, show them at a dog show, how to uh, get them to behave, uh, you know, teaching them manners and all that sort of stuff. So that's none of that's transa transactional queries. But if I wanted to, let's say, buy a digital camera, buy Canon 80D, well, that's a high transactional uh, sort of uh, intent. And then competitiveness, how competitive are these keywords? And then check this out. If I wanted to blow this particular keyword out of dog training schools, I just click on it and I click on expand topic and it looks within that topic for subtopics and then renders all that. And all these keywords are, are topics, I should say, are um, displayed visually from the center of this uh, you know, visualization, the center being my first topic that I entered, dog training, I can um, see that why are some of these topics far away from the center and some are very close? Well, because they're not nearly as related. So service dog training schools is pretty far away from dog training. Dog training tips is very close because those are more related keywords or more related topics to each other than service dog training schools. So this is an amazing tool. This has revolutionized uh, keyword research, and this came out uh, just in, in, in private beta late last year, and uh, it's now public for everybody who uh, has a paid account with the content suite um, with search metrics. I'll just love this tool. Yeah, no, I, I can definitely see how powerful it is, especially the sales funnel results, because the, uh, you know, it's absolutely true that somebody who is not even thinking about buying anything yet uh, is going to be using different words than somebody who's like got their credit card and is ready to purchase something. Like if somebody's typing in yeah. dog training book, they're probably ready to buy a book, uh, <laughs> I would assume. 
um, so that I can see how that that's super powerful. Now, uh, Stefan, you, we've covered quite a few tools here. Uh, I really appreciate you spending the extra time to show us, uh, you know, even just at a glance, these different tools. And I just I want to encourage anyone who's watching. I, I will link to these tools below the video so that you can check them out individually. But I do encourage somebody uh, not to get bogged down in too many tools. Maybe check one or two out at a time. Uh, but just keep the overall strategy in mind because you and I both know we there are a lot of tools to do a lot of different things online, but we 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 need to know the the foundation or the strategy first. And in this case, yeah. what we're trying to accomplish is we're trying to find out what our tar target audience is typing into search engines to find resources and information about what they want to learn. And we want our course or our website our programs, our products, our materials, if our stuff is the answer to them, we want them to be able to find us. And so using these kinds of tools makes it easier to, for them to do that. Um, exactly. So Stefan, thank, thank you again uh, for sharing you know, all of that with us. Um, now, are there any last words of advice, uh, big mistakes to avoid, anything we didn't touch on that you feel is important? Um, what, what would you like to wrap up with here? Yeah, so I wanted to recommend that most folks uh, will pretty easily be able to wrap their head around uh, the keyword research, picking out keywords that they can create content around, write blog posts, create uh, mini online courses and uh, sections within their bigger courses based on the keyword research. But the link building stuff is mostly elusive to folks because they don't know how, how do I get a link other than just emailing somebody and, and begging them for it, which doesn't work. How do I get people to link to me? So there's a chapter of my book, uh, the art of SEO chapter seven, that is awesome about how to get links. It's the, the content marketing chapter. Mm -hmm. And I can provide that to your viewers for free. Um, O'Reilly has, my publisher has um, allowed me to do this. Uh, so that would be a free download for everybody uh, watching or listening to get that uh, chapter. So if they go to stephanspencer.com slash free chapter, I'll hook them up. Perfect. Okay, so uh, stephanspencer.com slash free chapter. It's S-T-E-P-H-A-N. And... Uh, get that chapter that's a great starting point on content marketing perfect well thank you uh, thank you so much for offering that uh, that free resource I'll, I'll make sure I link to that as well uh, and stephanspencer.com that is your your home base online if anyone has questions for you or wants to get in touch with you uh, learn about your books your podcasts your courses all the other resources that you've got uh, is that the best place that we can direct people Yep. Yep. For sure. I mean, of course, there are my two podcast shows that have separate websites, but you can find those on stephanspencer.com as well. So marketingspeak.com and optimizegeek.com are both linked to from uh, from stephanspencer.com. And then there's some great resources in the resources area of webinar recordings and uh, videos of me presenting at conferences, white papers, checklists, worksheets, all sorts of great stuff. Perfect. Well, Stefan, thanks again. I really appreciate your time today and I wish you all the best. All right. Thanks.